everyone. Welcome back to Relax with Animal Facts. I am Steph Wolf, and today I'm going to be learning with you about our furry, scaly, or possibly even slimy friends. And in today's case, it is definitely going to be an animal not of any of those three, but rather of the feathery variety, because we are covering the oh so wonderful puffin. This is, of course, a very special listener episode dedicated to Molly, who wrote in via Instagram. Thank you so much for writing into the show. And if you would like to have an animal on the podcast that you'd like to learn about, you can send an email to relaxwithanimalfacts at gmail.com. Or alternatively, you could always send a message to the Instagram, which is just relax with animal facts. So this episode wouldn't be possible without you guys writing in. So Molly, thank you for writing in. And thank you to all of you who continue to write into the show saying very nice things and sometimes things that help me improve as a podcast host. I also appreciate that because this podcast, you know, I, I do enjoy learning about animals, of course, but I put the work into this podcast so I can hopefully help some of you out there. So whatever advice I can get to make the podcast better and make it um, more enjoyable for you guys to listen to, I am always listening with open ears. And now we are going to read a review from Apple Podcasts. So as it turns out, there are more reviews on Apple Podcasts than I originally thought. There seems to be a different amount of ratings and reviews on the different devices that I use. Cop 1991 from Great Britain writes, I was looking for something I could listen to at nighttime to fall asleep with that was easy to listen to and I didn't have to keep up with episode to episode. And this was the best I found. The host has a very soothing voice. Thank you, Cop. Very nice to listen to. And the content is actually very interesting and very easy to listen to as I fall asleep. Thank you so much for that wonderful review. I can't tell you how much it excites me and makes me glad that you guys can take some positive things out of this podcast because it's pretty much the entire reason why I do it in the first place. So I'm happy that the show uh, can be a help to some of you out there. And all the way from Great Britain. That's amazing. So before we get into the facts of the show, let us first, as always, sort of scan our body and see where we're carrying some of that tension. So I know that for some of you, it might be in different places than for me. For me, it's almost always in my shoulders, in my neck area. So maybe for you, it'll be it'll be in your legs or it'll be, you know, somewhere else in the arms, maybe. So if you can just direct your attention to where you're carrying that tension and you can try your best to let that go as we go into this immersive experience with me, Steph Wolf, into the coastal cliffs and offshore islands where puffins live. So I got my facts from heyiceland.is, worldwildlife.org, and mentalfloss.com. Those websites have so much information, not only about the puffin, but about plenty of other animals. And I highly recommend you guys going to check them out because all of the facts of this episode are coming from these three sources. So for the first fact, there are four species of puffins, three of which are slightly distinguishable from one another. The Atlantic and horned puffins look quite similar, with the exception of a blue-gray triangle at the base of the Atlantic puffin's beak. During the mating season, straw-like feathers protrude from the crown of the tufted puffin's head. The fourth species, the rhinoceros auklet, which is a great name if I may say so, doesn't look like the other three. It's actually ashen-colored, with a rhino-like protrusion during the breeding season although it is still technically a puffin. So here we can see that while they might look quite similar, they could have some distinguishable physical characteristics, which we see 
on this show time and time again. Puffins only possess technicolor bills and their matching orange feet that you might know them by already during the spring breeding season. Just before the winter sets in, they shed this colorful outer bill and leave a noticeably smaller and duller colored beak. So they aren't exactly so colorful all the time as some of the pictures suggest. But we're catching them in their best during the breeding season of spring. But even without these vibrant colors, the puffin is still something that is very, very cute uh, to look at. So we actually have two different facts about the name of the puffin. And I saved one for the end, but here's one for now. The puffin's genus name, Fratercula, comes from the Latin for little brother. The name refers to the seabird's black and white plumage, which was said to resemble the robes that monks once wore. So very interesting, a little bit, I suppose, of history and etymology of that word. If you're wondering how much a puffin weighs, it's about the same as a can of Coke. If you were to search them up and look at them, you wouldn't think that they would weigh so little. We learned on the Flamingo episode, for example, just how light they are, and they look very, very large. Some birds can really throw your brain for a loop because many of these flying creatures oftentimes have hollow bones and don't have the same density of mass that maybe we do. Puffins lay just one egg per year, and usually with the same mate. Like some penguins, both parents will take turns incubating the egg and caring for the chick. I like that we actually just got done with the penguin episode not too long ago. And here we are, we have a puffin with some of those same behavioral characteristics. And now it says that it's usually with the same mate, meaning that oftentimes puffins will be monogamous, meaning one partner. Um, but we see here that maybe it is not always the case. Puffins may chatter up a storm at their breeding colonies, but they remain perfectly silent at sea. So when they do get together, they're very vocal, you know, but when they're flying, they prefer to everybody just to have some quiet time and let's do our thing. It is not the time to talk. So we can see that maybe puffins are very professional sort of birds. There are currently eight isles around the world named Puffin Island. This is because they all are or once were home to very large colonies of puffins. So Puffin Island, it, I would think that you couldn't name different islands the same thing, but I guess who makes those rules anyway? I'm okay with having more than one Puffin Island. A puffin can fly as fast as 55 miles per hour. Compared with other auks, that is spelt A-U-K-S, which tend to stay a few feet above the sea, puffins usually maintain a cruising altitude of around 30 feet. 60% of the world's puffins breed in Iceland. So Iceland is the place to go if you want to see puffins breeding. 60% guys of the whole world. What an honor Iceland has there. Puffins are one of the few birds that have the ability to hold several small fish in their bills at a time. Their raspy tongues and spiny palates allow them to firmly grasp 10 to 12 fish during just one foraging trip. They thus can bring more food back to their young compared with other seabirds that tend to swallow and regurgitate meals for chicks. You guys know how on this show I like to compare the animals that we're learning about to human beings. And here, the first thing that comes to my mind is when your parents would tell you to unload the groceries from the back seat or from the, from the trunk of the car. So... You would go out and try to take as many groceries as possible. And if you had to go back for a second trip, you were a square. We had to get all of it in one trip. 
And that's kind of how I imagine the Puffin to be, except for them, it's not necessarily a game, right? For them, taking those 10 to 12 fish during one foraging trip could mean the difference between life or death for their chicks. And being a parent to these little puffing chicks is a very demanding job. The mother and father have to fly distances to hunt food in the open ocean and then return to their chicks with these mouthfuls of fish. And we see just how many fish they can take in one trip, but parents can supply their young with fish more than a hundred times per day. So of course, we learned on the penguin episode that penguins can't fly. They're flightless birds. But as we learned with puffins, the, although these guys look a little bit like penguins, they indeed can fly. But it is not without some serious effort. They have to flap their wings about 300 to 400 times per minute to stay afloat. And this is because they have very short wings and stout bodies. So they, they really have to try quite hard. So puffins do not construct the typical cup-shaped nest to raise their puffling, that is a baby puffin. Instead, they burrow into the ground, digging to a depth of about three feet with their beaks and their feet. And they will also find protected spots between rocks on steep cliffs, which protect these young birds from some of those predators. So it is interesting to see that these birds that fly tend to burrow into the ground and i'm not sure if this is specifically because they have a harder time flying than most birds that maybe nests up in high trees wouldn't exactly be the prime spot they instead are gonna opt to just burrow into that ground if they already find a burrow fantastic they get to use it if not they will have to dig and uh, dig that is about three feet with their beaks and with their feet so that's just so great puffins can live more than 20 years when it comes to birds puffins are going to lead some pretty long lives of course if we're comparing to you know uh, some other animals maybe not so long but uh, also with humans not so long but when you're comparing to other bird species we can see that two decades is a good amount of time for them. The oldest known puffin that was documented lived to be 36 years old, and the species' maximum age is difficult to gauge because dated leg bands often corrode in the puffin's salty habitat or become entirely illegible as the puffins will nest in those rocky environments. And in fact, it's hard to track which puffins were even banded at all. Researchers will oftentimes, when they are learning about certain species, particularly birds, will put on those bands on their legs. We've seen this with uh, some of the studies that were done on the Galapagos Islands, where these leg bands are very, very important to the researcher to identify which individual this is or which species is this so um, in the case of the puffin having that salty habitat can be a big hindrance to research right because it'll just corrode and wear away that band making it pretty much impossible for researchers to know hey this individual is part of our study or this individual was part of our study a puffin patrol helps rescue pufflings in Iceland's biggest puffin colony. Iceland is home to more than half of the world's puffin population, as we learned before. And each April, thousands of birds will return from the open ocean in order to breed. Residents of the main village on Jaime Island, the only inhabited island in the group, have formed a puffin patrol to help rescue pufflings who wander into town and to provide an estimate of the year's new chicks. In 2016, the last year for which data is readily available, 2,639 pufflings were brought into the Vestmanayar Fish and Natural History Museum to be examined and then finally released. 
So imagine having that on a resume, everybody. I was a member of the Puffin Patrol. I feel like it doesn't even matter if you're applying to be a lawyer at that point. You're probably going to get the job. How can you say no to a member of the Puffin Patrol? So not only is this very cool, but it's also very important for uh, preservation of species um, and for researchers to know how many are left in the wild. For the last fact of the episode, we're going to talk about the name Puffin again. The name Puffin refers to the young birds' roly-poly look as according to Mental Floss. Puffins are called several names based on their appearance. Puffin is thought to come from the word puff, meaning swollen, because the fluffy pufflings do appear quite round. Puffins have also been referred to as the clowns of the ocean, or sea parrots, thanks to their amusing expression and colorful beak. Puffins have also been referred to as the clowns of the ocean, or sea parrots, thanks to their amusing expression and a very colorful beak. I think that's just so great, and I'm not exactly sure how accurate this is that puffins actually came from the word puff uh, or swollen, so I'm not sure, but I think it fits the bill. I love learning about the names at the end of the podcast. I think it's always such a cool way to end the show to learn, hey, where does this name come from? That is the final fact of the show. If you would like to hear about an animal on the podcast, make sure to send an email to relaxwithanimalfacts at gmail.com or follow the Instagram relaxwithanimalfacts and send a message to that Instagram. I reply to each and every one of you. I love getting new messages. They always brighten up my day, so keep sending them, guys. Again, if you want to help support the show, following on Spotify or leaving a rating and review on Apple Podcasts that I will read and shout you out for on the show can be so helpful to growing the show. And to those of you who support the PayPal, support the Patreon, if you want to help support the show in more of that way, you can go to relaxwithanimalfacts.com and all that information is there for you at the top. So thank you guys so much for listening. I'm so grateful that you were able to join me today and I hope you have found some much needed rest. I will see you all on the next podcast episode with the next animal. Take care.